Spacecraft Windows. The unsung heroes of space travel that not only offer astronauts unparalleled cosmic views, but also bear the brunt of the unwelcoming conditions found in space. They serve as gatekeepers between humans and the hostile vacuum of space, expertly crafted to withstand the raging temperatures of re-entry and even the most judgmental scrutiny of micrometeoroids and space junk bombardment. These are no ordinary windows. They are remarkable works of engineering, and they are keeping our astronauts, quite literally, from losing their air over the mesmerizing beauty of space. So, in today's deep dive, spacecraft windows. Links to all the sources will be listed in the description box down below. One important fact, any windows on a manned spacecraft will be located on the back surface, also called the leeward side or at least very close to it, during atmospheric re-entry. This side experiences a lower heat transfer compared to the windward side, so it does not reach as high temperature because the pressure is considerably lower. This happens because the compressed hot gas on the windward side expands to the sides, causing the pressure to drop quickly, thereby reducing the gas temperature as well. That being said, we shouldn't overlook the fact that even on the colder sides, these windows still must be able to withstand temperatures as high as 1000 degrees Celsius. To achieve this, spacecraft windows are typically made of high quality glass, normally a combination of fused silica or fused quartz, and also aluminum silicate. The windows on the space shuttle were made of these materials. They were manufactured by the company Corning. Actually, Corning manufactured the windows for every manned US space flight light from Mercury through the space shuttle program, the tiny windows that Neil Armstrong used to visually guide the Apollo 11 lunar lander to a safe landing on the moon, it was Corning that created them. They also made the 8 meter mirrors for the twin Gemini telescopes, as well as the primary mirror for the Kepler space telescope. Now back to the windows in the space shuttle. They were divided into three layers. The inner pane, which was a tempered aluminum silicate, and uh, whose primary objective was to maintain the pressurized environment of the spacecraft. Then there was the outer pane, a 1.6 inch or 1.5 centimeter thick plate made of fused silica, and which had to put up with the most hostile parts of the mission, such as extreme heating and debris impacting at high velocities. And finally, there was the thick middle or redundant pane, also made of fused silica, which basically provided redundancy should the other two panes fail for whatever reason. This one was capable of withstanding both re-entry temperature and cabin pressure. The Orion spacecraft also uses fused silica for its windows, although for the inner pressure pane, this time around, NASA preferred to use acrylic plastic instead of aluminum silicate for added structural strength and durability, as well as reduced weight. The Soyuz capsule also uses fused silica for its windows, although I don't know what the structure of their windows is. I assume it's also three layers. Now, I'm also not sure what SpaceX is using for their Dragon spacecraft, but again, if I had to guess, I'd say they are made of similar material with a similar uh, pain layering. So now let's talk a little bit about the material itself, fused silica, what makes it special, and then we're going to have a look at a paper published in 1995, the year I was born, uh, that discusses the topic of orbital impacts on the space shuttle windshield, which is really fascinating stuff. But first, uh, fused silica has uh, some quite unique properties that make it resistant to high temperatures. It is a glass composed of almost pure silicon dioxide, and in the majority of silicon dioxides, the silicon atom likes to have four oxygen atoms around itself to complete its outer shell of electrons. And so silicon dioxide forms these uh, three-dimensional high-strength solids with each silicon atom having a strong covalent bond with uh, the other four oxygen atoms. And uh, the main advantages of these strong bonds are twofold. It takes a lot of energy to break them. This contributes to the very high melting point of around uh, 1700 degrees Celsius that this material has. And secondly, it causes the material to have an extremely low coefficient of thermal expansion, which means that it doesn't expand or contract too much when it's heated or cooled quickly, therefore allowing it to undergo rapid temperature changes without cracking. So now let's uh, talk about atmospheric re-entry, debris impact and overall window damage, specifically on the space shuttle because it is the space shuttle that I found the most information about. So 
after every flight, the shuttle would, of course, be thoroughly examined and the window inspection was a crucial part of this turnaround processing. Technicians would clean the outer thermal panes with a soft cloth and water and then using a handheld magnifying lens and bright lights, they would inspect the entire surface uh, very carefully, looking for any sort of damage like scratches, pits or bruises. Whenever they found something that looked like an in-flight impact and they were sure that it hadn't been caused by handling the window or contact with tools, it was written down and uh, documented. They also measured the depth of the impact by taking a mold impression and looking at its profile with the help of a microscope. And so this data was recorded on a problem report form and then the windows were stress tested again. The strength of the thermal pane is quite important because it must remain pretty much intact throughout all flight regimes uh, to provide the thermal protection it is designed for. And well, since the pane's strength uh, is directly related to its surface condition, any damage on a window could greatly reduce the strength. So that's why these post-flight stress tests uh, were a very important thing to do to determine whether the panes were still suited to perform another flight or whether they had to be replaced with new ones. This analysis also included an estimated assessment of the remaining life of the window since glass strength decreases with time under load, uh, which is also one of the reasons why NASA decided to go with acrylic for the inner panels of the Orion capsule's windows. In some cases, they even got away with uh, flipping the panes over and installing them in the opposite direction, which might seem cheap, but you know, each window cost the government between $30,000 and $50,000. So, as of December 1994, 45 windows had been replaced because of impact damage. A total of 177 impacts had been reported at the time since STS-1, and that averaged one replaced window every 10.8 days in orbit. And so they looked at all these impacts that they could find and found that they typically showed a circular crater with a central pit, but what's more interesting is the impact distribution among the windows relative uh, to their position on the vehicle. Assuming the vehicle is flying nose first in the direction it's moving, the forward windows are expected to have the highest impact count makes sense, uh, whereas the uh, overhead and side hatch windows are expected to uh, have the fewest impacts. And so they uh, looked at the data and found that uh, this expected impact distribution was confirmed for the most part except for the left middle and left side windows, which showed more and fewer impacts uh, respectively, compared to the right side windows. One of the possible reasons they found for this uneven distribution by looking at the flight history was that the right wing was more often facing forward than the left wing did, although it could have also been due to inspection errors or also due to the fact that uh, most of the time the shuttle was actually orbiting with its tail facing forward or its bottom or other random orientations. Also interesting is the fact that whereas altitude did not seem to be a factor determining impact rate, the orbital inclination did show to have high relevance. High inclination missions above 50 degrees showed a significantly higher impact rate than the 28.5 degree flights. Moreover, the debris that impacted the windows during high inclination missions resulted in deeper craters than would have been the case by the same particle but at a lower inclination. And to be clear, all these impacts were really minuscule. The majority of craters didn't surpass 0 0.01 inches or 0 0.25 millimeters in depth, although the average depth of an impact that would result in the removal of a window was even lower than that, around 0 0.006 inches or 0 0.15 millimeters. It's also kind of surprising that it was the side windows that had to be replaced the most, especially the right side window. But keep in mind that all this data I'm showing you right now is only representative of the first 66 uh, shuttle flights that happened until uh, 1994. So that's almost half of the total shuttle flights. So now to the question, what kind of debris hit the windows? So in most cases, there was no evidence of the original projectile visible in the crater. And sometimes there would be dirt on the window that could be mistaken for projectile material. 
So the only way to determine the source of the impact with certainty was by using a scanning electron microscope and so they would have to take the windows apart, basically destroying them to be able to get the crater and the pit into the microscope stage. Uh, they did this with 11 windows and for 9 of them they found that the majority of these impacts uh, were man-made debris with only three of them being micrometeorite impacts. They could also make certain deductions about the projectile source based on the correlation between impact velocity and uh, crater diameter. Man-made debris is limited to a maximum velocity of about 14 kilometers per second, but natural space materials, space rocks, could have velocities relative to the spacecraft as fast as 70 kilometers per second. And so higher velocity impacts against windows would leave more molten glass behind compared to lower impact velocities, as well as less cracking. On the other hand, oftentimes man-made debris has a higher density than natural space material with densities ranging from aluminum to steel and even denser metals. And so even though these pieces could have a much lower impact velocity than space rocks, they would still leave larger craters in the shuttle's windows. Now all these impacts were caused by particle-sized debris, but what if the pieces of debris were larger? I was reading about an impact report on the cupola of the ISS in 2016 and then I stumbled upon the following paragraph. While a chip like the one shown here may be minor, larger debris would pose a serious threat. An object up to one centimeter in size could disable an instrument or a critical flight system on a satellite Anything above one centimeter could penetrate the shields of the station's crew modules, and anything larger than 10 centimeters could shatter a satellite or spacecraft into pieces. So I guess we're lucky that a human-made space debris isn't a big concern, right? <laughs> so, I hope you found this video helpful, entertaining, and full of new things you didn't know. I did learn a lot myself researching this one, and I'm very proud of myself. I think it's a good video. If you're interested, you can also find me on Twitter. I don't usually publish much, uh, but uh, hey, I'm there. So thank you for watching and I'll see you soon again. Take care, have a nice day, bye bye.